Today we're continuing a series that we began last week entitled, From the Heart. Through the fall we've been slow walking, through Jesus teaching us in the Beatitudes the question, what does it mean to have a flourishing life? What does it mean to be fully alive as citizens of the kingdom of God following after the Savior in this broken world? And we're continuing to slow walk through the journey of the Sermon on the Mount as we now ask the question, what does it mean to follow God from the heart? Last week, Jesus taught us that he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, that the story that the Hebrew Scriptures tell find their completion and find their fulfillment in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that he is the faithful covenant partner. Where Israel and humanity fails, Jesus succeeds. And that because of his perfect obedience, all the blessings that God had promised find their yes and amen in him. And that through faith in his work on our behalf, We are united to him in his obedience by the work of the Holy Spirit. And one of those benefits that we saw from last week that was promised in the Hebrew Scriptures through the prophets was the promise that when the Savior comes and when the Savior lives a life that we could not, that God will give us a new spirit, the Holy Spirit. And that he will remove from us our heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And as the scriptures say that he will cause us to walk after his statutes and follow his decrees. Why? Because what is written on our new hearts. Because what the scriptures teach is written on our new hearts is the law of God. And that because of this new heart, we will be enabled by the Holy Spirit to follow him from the heart. And now Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount begins to unpack in six different examples what does it mean that we are made new in Him? What does it mean that we have these new hearts and what does it mean that the law is written there and now we can follow Him from the heart? And our reading uh, is from Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount beginning in verse 21, uh, I think through verse 26. So if you would, in honor of the the word of the Lord, stand with me as we read this together. And we stand to honor God, His word, and His reading. Starting in verse 21 of chapter 5. Jesus teaches, You have heard that it was said to people long ago, You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. And though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the gift of the inspiration of the scriptures. We pray this morning that we would be blessed in its reading, that we would be blessed in its hearing, and by your Holy Spirit empowering us, may we be blessed in its keeping. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as we ask the question this morning, what does it mean to follow God from the heart? I want to begin by suggesting that if we are going to follow God from the heart, following God from the heart prioritizes relationship. 
And that what Jesus is unpacking here is a teaching that shows us if we are going to follow God from the heart, this new heart that's a heart of flesh, then we will prioritize relationships. As Jesus teaches us, he does so using a threefold structure. He begins not only in this example, but in also the ones to follow, by giving us what we might call the letter of the law. He then expounds on that letter of the law with what we might call the heart or the spirit of that law, and then applies it to his hearers. And we want to follow that same structure this morning as we say, what is the letter of the law, the heart of it, and then how can we apply it to ourselves, not simply for a first century Palestinian audience, but for a early 21st century audience here in Brighton, Michigan. So we'll begin where Jesus does by giving the letter of the law. And Jesus does it with a phrase that he says each time, you have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. Jesus is here speaking what every one of his hearers would have already known. He is not saying anything that was new information. He's simply quoting from the Ten Commandments, which we find twice in the Old Testament, once in Exodus 20 and the second time in Deuteronomy 5. And he's saying, you have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. Now for many of his listeners and for many of his hearers, to keep the law was simply to follow its letter. And we must remember that in the last verse prior to this, Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds the, that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Yet for many of his listeners, for the scribes and the Pharisees, to keep the law was simply to follow its letter. That is, we are keeping the law as long as I don't raise my hand to take the life of another person. And that is not simply the temptation of a first century audience. That's the temptation throughout history. It's a human temptation to think that we are in the right when we are keeping the letter of the law. And one person who pointed that out to about Western society was a man named Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was someone who escaped out of the communist uh, regime out of the USSR in the mid-20th century. He was an author who won the Nobel, Peace, or Nobel Prize in Literature in 1970, and it was someone that opened the eyes of the West to the atrocities that were happening behind the Iron Curtain. And in 1978, he gave the commencement address at Harvard, and I want to read you just a portion of what Alexander Solzhenitsyn said in that commencement address in 1978. And although that's 40 years ago, I would suggest that it's either just as true today, if not more so. And here's what he said. He said, Western society has given itself the organization best suited to its purposes based, I would say, on the letter of the law. People in the West have acquired considerable skill in interpreting and manipulating law, which is why we have so many lawyers. No offense to any lawyers present. <laughs> any conflict is solved according to the letter of the law. And this is considered to be the supreme solution. If one is right from a legal point of view, if one is right according to the letter of the law, nothing more is required. Nobody will mention that one could still not be entirely right. And to urge self-restraint or to urge a willingness to renounce such legal rights or an urge for sacrifice or selfless risk, it would seem simply absurd. One almost never sees voluntary self-restraint. Everybody operates at the extreme limit of those legal frames. Now what Solzhenitsyn is saying is that adults are not that different from children. And I don't know if you're like me, but there's a certain phenomena that happens when you go on road trips with children. <laughs> the parents are in the front seat and the children are in the back. And when it's a long field trip, you know, you're going for more than a short distance, something inevitably happens. Those children begin to fight. Now, 
Parents in the front sort of think, well, maybe I'll just let it go, maybe they'll stop. Does that ever happen? <laughs> Not very often. In fact, what ends up happening is it ends up ratcheting up. And what begins as something small becomes something much bigger until they're screaming and punching and hitting and everything. And then the parents in the front have to decide, am I going to get into an accident or am I going to deal with this? Or maybe both. And so the parent will turn back to the children in the back and say, stop fighting with each other. You've got to stop. And stop touching each other. Right? When, as soon as a parent says stop touching each other, what does one of the children inevitably do? Take their finger and put it about two millimeters from the eyeball of the other kid. And when the parent yells again, stop doing that, I told you not to do that, what does the child say? I'm not touching them. You told me not to touch them. I'm not touching them. Now, is the child correct? Yes. If following the law was to be interpreted as simply following the letter of the law, then yes, the child is right. But does the parent have every right to get angry when the child does that? Yes, because the child is not understanding the true intent of what the parent was saying. And Jesus is going to show us that that is also the case with this law and with the law in general. And so Jesus moves beyond the letter of the law to show us what we might call the heart or the spirit of the law. And he does that with a familiar phrase. Just as he introduces the letter of the law, saying, you have heard it said, when he introduces the heart of the law, he says this, but I tell you, but I tell you. Now, when Jesus says, but I tell you, what he is not doing is dismissing what he had just said. He's not saying, well, you have heard it said too long ago, you shall not murder, but I tell you, and I set aside that law, or we're putting aside the law, the law has no relevance anymore, I'm telling you something else. We want to keep in mind what Jesus told us last week. Jesus teaches us, I did not come to set aside the law. So what Jesus is not doing is setting it aside. What is he doing? He's showing us the true intent of what was there all the time. It's a lot like, um, uh, there was a movie, I don't even know what this is, uh, The Dora the Explorer, right? You want to watch Dora? Now, I'm giving, you tell my parent of young kids, I give lots of little kid examples. Um, anyway, so you watch Dora the Explorer, and there's, there's this character in Dora called The Map, and it comes out and it sings a song, I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map. <laughs> Whoever wrote that song was like not very smart. No. Is there any other? <laughs> I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map. Anyway, so in this map, there, any treasure map, you know, just Google treasure map and put image. There's going to be a map of a, of a place, and there's a little dotted line that you follow that gets to where the treasure is. Now, where the treasure is on the map, what's on the map where the treasure is? An X, right? So you follow the treasure to where the X is. And let's say you do that. So you're following the treasure, you have Dora's map, and you follow the treasure to the, the map to where the treasure is. There's a, you're standing on the ground above where the treasure is because there's an X. Now, here's the question. Is that where the treasure is? Yeah, that's where the treasure is. But is it the treasure? What must you do to get to the treasure? You've got to take out your shovel and begin to dig. And I would say that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's saying this letter of the law is, yeah, that's, that's where it is. I mean, that's, that's true. But to truly understand the treasure that is this law, and the law is a treasure, you must dig. You must dig. Have you ever wondered why in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in what? The law. We all like Psalm 1, don't we? Do you delight in the law? If you are to be blessed, then you do. And what does the blessed man who delights in the law meditate day and night on? The law, he meditates day and night on it. Why in the world would you delight and meditate on the law day and night? Because there's something much deeper and much richer than simply the letter of it. And in order to get to beyond the letter of it, you must meditate and chew upon it. And that's what Jesus is going to show us. And he gives us three examples of the heart beyond the letter of the law. First, he says, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister 
will be subject to judgment. He then says, anyone again who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable in the court, and then finally, anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So quickly, just, just so we're clear, the word Raka means empty-headed. It's like calling someone stupid. You're stupid. The word you fool, which we normally think about as being low intelligence, is not what that word means. The uh, original Greek word means someone of low moral character. It's like calling someone a scoundrel or a villain or something. You're, you're not a nice guy, person. So here's what Jesus is saying is, the heart of this law not to murder is not or the point of it, it's not simply to point to this external act of taking life. It's to point towards the internal disposition of the heart that leads someone on a pathway or on a journey to be the person who would take life. And that if you're going to follow me from the heart, you are not simply going to be concerned with the end of that journey. You are going to be concerned with the beginning of that journey. And where does the beginning of that journey start? In the heart. Anyone who is angry. And where does anger reside? Within our souls. Judgment is not just for taking a life. Judgment is for the disposition that puts you on a journey that leads that you might do that. And what do the Scriptures teach? Out of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. It's not simply taking a life. It's out of the heart that you say things like stupid. It's out of the heart that you start insulting and saying things inappropriately to your brothers and your sisters. And this is not simply just just the teaching here of Jesus. This is the teaching through Scripture, Old and New Testament. But I want to show you some other places just to expound upon this. One a little bit later in the New Testament, if you would, turn with me to the book of James, chapter 1. Now, James is going to be just after the book of Hebrews. As you're turning there, James is very much like a New Testament book of Proverbs. It's kind of the closest thing we have in the New Testament to a wisdom book. And here in verse 19, James teaches us by saying, Dear brothers and sisters, Take note of this. I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to say. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Human anger. This is the anger that stems from human pride, selfishness, and sinfulness. That this human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. The Bible teaches that your heart, your soul, is like soil. And on the soil of your heart fall seeds. And those seeds will take root and produce. And what James is showing us here is that when the seeds of human anger, bitterness, and resentments take root in the soil of your heart, and you allow those to perpetuate and be cultivated, it will produce a harvest. But that harvest is not the righteousness that God desires. The harvest that we reap when we cultivate the seeds of bitterness anger and resentment is the harvest of words spoken in anger. It's the harvest that will lead ultimately to the ultimate cutoff of relationship, which is murder itself. But he goes on to say in verse 21, therefore get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and with humility accept the word planted in you which can save you. This is very much what Jesus teaches us in the parable of the soils. That your heart is a soil. And that it's not simply the seeds of anger that are being sowed there. But there is a good seed. And what is the good seed? The seed of the Word of God. And who sows the seed? The Holy Spirit. 
And when you allow the seed of the word to be planted within the soil of your soul, it also produces. Jesus teaches us that when the seed falls upon the good soil, the good seed upon the good soil, it produces. But it produces a different kind of a crop than the seed of anger and resentments and bitterness. It, re- it produces 30, 60, 100 times what was sown, a harvest of righteousness. The righteousness that accords with the righteousness of God. One more passage, and that is a couple, just a couple uh, chapters later, really, because you have James first and second Peter, then first John, chapter three. Here the Apostle John says, starting at verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life. In other words, he's going to say, how do we, you know, here's how we know that we are born again. Here's how we know that we have the new life in Christ. We've gone from darkness to light. We know that we have passed from death to life, he says, because we love each other. Because we love each other. Think about the, probably the greatest exposition on the true meaning of love in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 13. And there the Apostle Paul says many things about love. One thing that Paul says about love is that it is not self-seeking. It says that love is not quick to become angry. How many of you and I are self-seeking? And because we're self-seeking, and because we're lovers of self, we are quick to become angry. And I know if you're like me, there are times where I'll just be something I'll be having about my day, maybe with my family, maybe at work or something will happen, and it's like, boom, anger wells up within me very quickly because of something somebody said or something that I perceived or something like that. What it's showing is that I'm a lover of self. (laughs) And that's an indicator. It's like a warning light on your dashboard. Something's going on in your heart. If you are quick to well up in anger like that, something's going on. What's happening in here? Because the other thing that Paul says about love, not simply that it's not self-seeking and that it isn't quick to become angry, he also says that love keeps no record of wrongs. Now, how many of us are experts at keeping records of wrongs? And isn't kind of that the natural thing to do when we're hurt? is to allow that hurt like a seed to fall upon the soil of our hearts. To allow that hurt and that bitterness and resentments to spread its roots down. As we rehearse again and again the record of wrongs. What was said, the words of the email, the text, the words spoken in anger, that will produce, it will produce a harvest, but not a harvest that you want to reap. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. He says, anyone who does not love remains in death. In verse 15, he says, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a what? Murderer. When we begin to get real with what the law is truly teaching us, we realize to follow the true heart of the law goes much beyond physically taking a life. That when we foster and cultivate and allow to grow within our heart hatreds, we take on the character of being a murderer. And as he goes on to say, you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. The heart, it's the heart, it's the beginning of the journey, not simply the ending. And Jesus then goes on to expound that with two examples of what does it mean to live from the heart. And he gives us, as I said, two different examples that uh, apply to us today as well. He says, firstly, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift 
in front of the altar and go first. Be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Interesting, I'll say it this, but also it's the example to follow as well. If you put your place, put yourself in the place of the person that Jesus is describing at the altar, when it comes to mind, is it that you've done something to somebody else or they've done something to you that comes to mind in this example? Have you done something to somebody else that comes to mind or has somebody done something to you that comes to mind? It's that your brother or sister has something against you. It's something that you've done. And let us be reminded that all of us have offended others, not necessarily even on purpose. But maybe there's things in our lives we need to get right with when we've offended others. But here's what Jesus says. When you come to bring your gift to the altar, when you are at the place of worship, and it comes to mind that there is a relationship in your life that is broken, I, God, my priority is not that you offer your gift. My priority as God is that you prioritize that relationship. And prioritizing that relationship means you go first, be reconciled there, and then come back and offer your gift. Which might mean that there might be someone here this morning where God would be saying to you, brother, sister, son, daughter, I would have rather you not come to church this morning. I would have rather you get right than to be here. There may be someone here that says, God cares more that you get right in that relationship than you give your tithe. God cares more that you get right in that relationship than you go on that mission trip. God cares more and prioritizes relationship more that you get right than you come to the next prayer meeting. Because when we are reconciled with God, the scriptures teach that what inevitably comes, which is a vertical reconciliation with God, what inevitably follows is a horizontal relationship of reconciliation with our brothers and sisters. That when you are reconciled to God, you become reconciled with your brothers and your sisters. And by the way, what does that form? It forms a cross. And the cross should be a reminder to us that we are vertically reconciled to God, but we are also horizontally reconciled with our brothers and our sisters. Now, sometimes you attempt to do that and it doesn't go very well. Sometimes you try to reconcile, but can you force someone to reconcile with you? You cannot force that. Which is why the scriptures teach, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. That the onus is on you to go and attempt to repair the brokenness in the relationship, and that God cares more about that than your act of worship. And finally, before I move on, it's also a temptation, I would say, for us to substitute external acts of religious devotion for dealing with the realities of our inward consciences that we can kind of cover up what we know to be true in our heart because we think that, well, I'm doing this outward act of devotion to God. God says, I care more about your inward conscience than your outward act. And then he gives a second example. He says in this one, uh, it's more of a legal example. And he says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. He says, do it while you're still together. And on the way, or your adversary will hand over to the judge, to the officer, and then into the prison where you'll pay back everything that is owed. So again, just like the last example, if you put yourself in the place of the individual Jesus is describing, it's something that you have done. You have done. And when you look at the different commentators on this passage, in the previous example, commentators are pretty unified, you know, little differences, but little pretty unified. In this example, commentators are at different places and exactly to understand what Jesus is getting at which I think leaves it open uh, to more, okay, what, more different kind of understandings of maybe how you would apply this. So as I've been meditating on this this week, here's something maybe that might be helpful in a way. Again, we said that if we're going to follow God from the heart, we prioritize relationship. And that we all, we just said that we all, at some point in our lives, 
have offended other people by things we've said or done. Maybe even a few days ago on Thanksgiving. Maybe you said something. Maybe you did something. I don't know. It happens. And that's when we do something to offend someone else and we know about it. Sometimes we don't know. You can't do anything about what you don't know. But then you know it. And that person either made it aware to you or you just kind of know. Again, the onus is on you to go and repair it. That's what the first example is saying. Go and repair that. Repair that right away. But when we don't, that relationship continues to break down. Eventually, you might even stop talking. Because now you're further on down the path. It starts here, but you're further on the path. You know, now you're not talking anymore. But you've done something to offend them. Now, here's something that is basically true of human beings. If they have something against someone else and they can't get justice, because that's what they're looking for is justice probably in some way. You've done something to them, they want justice. And justice is going to look a hundred different ways to a hundred different people. If they can't get justice from you by what they perceived you've done, they will go somewhere else to get it. Now, in this case, Jesus gives the example of someone being taken to court. Now, if you do something that's really bad, they might call a lawyer. But most examples don't go to that extent. But I can imagine that maybe a work situation where you didn't take the steps to figure it out to repair the relationship so they have something against you, it breaks down with time and eventually they're going to go to your boss. And they're going to get justice there. If they're two children where the relationship breaks down and it, it, there was a, something was done to another and they can't figure it out, eventually one of the child is going to go to who? Mom or dad. To get justice. They're going to go somewhere to get justice. If it's two friends and the relationship breaks down, they're going to go around and they're going to talk to other people to get justice. Other people. Because they're going to go to some th third party to get justice. And Jesus says, if that happens, the situation is much worse for you. If that person goes around you to your boss, does your situation get better or worse? If, they, if, that, if you can't deal it out with your friend and eventually they go around you to talk to other people, does that situation get better or worse? It gets worse. So Jesus is saying, deal with it while you're, I think the most important phrase, while you're still together. Get it figured out. Because if you don't get it figured out, they're going to go around you. And they're going to get justice some other way. And your situation at the end is worse than at the beginning. Because if we're going to follow God from the heart, we must prioritize relationship. Final thought, and then we'll close. Final thought. Do you know how many laws there are in the Old Testament? 611. 611 laws. It's a lot. Do you know them all? We should know. It's a lot of laws. Now, what are those laws there for? There are many ways to answer that question. But I would suggest one primary reason that the, there are 611 laws in the Old Testament is to teach the people of God how to be in right relationship. There are 611 laws to teach God's people how to be in right relationship. How to be in right relationship with God, what it means to be in relationship with God, and how to be in relationship with each other. And how do you do that? Because that gets complicated sometimes. And that is the sum of those 611 laws which is exactly, I would suggest, what Jesus taught. When someone would come to Jesus and say, Jesus, how do I follow the law? How do I follow all 611 laws plus all these thousands of laws the Pharisees add, or whatever the number is? Jesus, how do I follow this? Jesus says there are two. One is what? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Be 100% devoted to God. And the second is like it. What? Love your neighbor as yourself. This sums up all the law. The law teaches us that God prioritizes relationship. Will we prioritize relationship like God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in the person of Christ, we see a perfect example of what it means to follow you from the heart. Lord, I pray that this morning you would shed light 
on any root of anger, bitterness, or resentment which may have taken root in the soil of our soul. And Lord, we pray that if there's anyone here, myself first, that needs to take action to set things right in relationship, that we would be the first ones to initiate and that we would do so in submission and in following after the direction of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.